So today we'll start with the Martin Luther King. And I did expect you to write, read that 12 page essay. That was the only one I actually expected besides finding your own. Um, let's see, Jordan, can you turn your video on and Erin? Um, okay, good. I like to see faces. Um, so does someone have a reaction to the Martin Luther King letter outline? Um, so I'll just ask each of you, or I'll ask one of you, and then you can talk to each other, honestly. Um, Ryan, you want to start? Ryan? Okay. Um, anybody else want to start? Michael, go ahead. Wait, Zane, do you want to go? No, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so one of the first quotes that I looked at said, uh, well, not, uh, this is like a well-known one, but um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think that that was pretty easy to tie back to some of the other stuff that we've talked about. Um, like, I think in a much broader sense, uh, it, it kind of relates to the idea that when a system is abused or corrupted in any way, um, then like, it's easier to falter moving forward from there. Okay. Somebody else, you can react to what Michael said or bring your own point. Um, just kind of something that I saw that was pretty cool or what I liked was when he's talking about like uh, if there's injustice somewhere, you know, it affects, you know, or threatens justice everywhere. And I liked his view on that because he just kind of pointed out that um, it's not in just one place. And if you just focus on one place, that's not necessarily going to, you know, be a solution to the problem. And he's like trying to have a broader view and like to, you know, have a solution to the problem. There needs to be a broader view and like a broader area and which it affects people. I like the beginning of the letter where he addresses that he's not an outsider. Like the argument that he's an outsider simply because he's a person of color isn't true. He's from the South. He knows these people. He knows like the, what kind of lives they live and probably why they have the prejudices they do, which is why he speaks to them in the manner he does. To add on to what Jordan said, I really, that was gonna be my comment. I thinking about how he was like, I'm a person of color does not mean I'm separate. I'm from in a different group or a different caste system or like separate from you. Um, it just shows how like people think based off like how they look, they separate themselves or how they act, they separate themselves. But in reality, we're all just one group of human beings in my opinion. Go ahead, somebody else. Um, I kind of liked when he was talking about laws. When he's like, uh, a just law is just a man-made code type of thing. And that there is supposedly some moral obligation and some law of the gods. I kind of thought that was pretty cool because it really questions every law that was made and like why. I agree with that. Um, it's saying that just because it's a law, it's not morally correct. And I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, and he was like, the, the reason I'm in jail is because injustice is here in Birmingham. Um, so that speaks to what I believe the moral obligation of the law is to protect its citizens equally. So, yeah. Aaron? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I like the part where he says, he says like that he, that he, 
use immoral means to attain moral ends, but like it's also wrong to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. So like basically it's like just calling out people who are complicit in it. Like if you're actively like keeping them in power or whatever, blah, 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 you, you have a, like you're responsible for it as well. If you're complicit in uh, violence or just don't say anything, then it makes you complicit. That is what I mean. And it's like when people who like nowadays that can even be seen with Black Lives Matter movement, where when people were just silent whenever it happened and then they actually like did marches and stuff, you could see that people were more upset about damage to property than a human life that was lost. So they are also complicit in that sense. Going with what Jordan talked about, yeah, you notice how a lot of people were like, a lot of people were being mazed, tear, like tear gas, pepper sprayed. A lot of people were being injured by the police, but the main focus was, oh, that target down the street? Yeah, it's not a target anymore. It's rubble. Like that can be replaced. I've, I've seen pictures of children who were mazed. Like the way our focus is wrong. We need to focus on the matter that needs to be fixed. Yeah, people lost eyes. They like, you know, got intensely injured and they were treated because the right to peaceful assembly, because that's what it was to originate. It was, they were all peaceful assemblies. And then they were coerced into violence at some points. Like with the target thing, the reason why it got violent was because they were turning people away because they were part of the protest. And so people started getting violent because of that. And I don't know. It, it's just a less complicated issue than people make it out to be. I don't think it should be property versus person because there should be no contest. The person matters more. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say like I did, I did like a paper on this is like how the media frames certain issues and that makes a huge difference. Like there is, there is like two different types of protests. I think it was like a pro-life protest versus the Black Lives Matter protest. And it was like these people are like rampaging and all these like rioting and destructing all of these things versus people doing standing up for their right. Like it was like really, really weird. And like it just depends on how the media frames it and it just shows the biases. And speaking on like the, I don't know, it's just like a hard situation, like because the media made it seem as it like again, we talked about this like a few weeks ago about how like they try to turn people against people, like everyday people. Like, I think at the end of the day, like it's really like, like what Jordan said, it shouldn't be property versus human being, like human rights, like at the end of the day. But then it's like everyday citizens that have like, you know, mom and pop shops or whatever. And that's rare in California, but that still happened. Like I saw a lot of stories of like people's like, like that came as immigrants and stuff like that. And then they got their shop and then it was destructive, you know? But then of course that's what the media blast out is like those people, you know, instead of Louis Vuitton getting, you know, like burnt up. But at the end of the day, it's the government pitting each other. Like there shouldn't even be rights about human rights anyways. And so that's when people like everyday human, everyday people and businesses get hurt is because the system that's in place. So if I could piggyback off what Lexi and um, Jordan said when they were saying they don't really understand the real purpose, there was, um, I don't know if it was last year or a few months ago, I can't remember, but there was like a riot at the White House or something like that. And like a whole bunch of people were like rioting and literally invading it and not one of them got shot. Maybe one of them got hurt, I think. But that's, that's exactly what they're talking about. Like you're telling me Black Lives Matter movement was so destructive you had to hurt those people that much and but you have people who are invading the white house literally as the act of terrorism like ryan said and you're telling me that's more that's that's not a threat that's, come on now like that just don't make any sense to me because the real problem is the injustice in general i mean they say there's no more racism but that has to be racism because I don't care what nobody says. If those were black people who did that, I guarantee you most of them would be dead. So if they don't understand. 
I don't know. The justice system is kind of corrupt for that, but I don't know. New president, I guess. I just looked it up and looking at it. So the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So the inv invasion, like the invasion of the White House was off of Trump supporters being angry about Congress and everyone trying to get Trump out of the White House. If that was just saying- well, They were trying to keep him in the White House. They were trying to keep him in, but that's why they invaded it. Um, but if that was the Black Lives Matter protest, no, they were tased. They, they were tased before they even reached the White House. That's just. And like the worst part is that like, like the police military were called in on Black Lives Matter movement, but not whenever there were insurgents at the fucking Congress building who were actively targeting different senators, literally some other senators were live tweeting the uh, locations of Nancy Pelosi and AOC so that they would be targeted and killed. <laughs> like it was insane. And the people who got hurt were hurt by themselves. Like the woman who died got trampled by her own people. The guy who tased, tased himself. Like he tased himself. It, it's it's insane to see. And then someone else wanted, to, uh, I saw like an article about it. The reason why these people aren't getting in trouble is because a lot of them were cops themselves. The people who went. So, it's not smart, honestly. Just you, you could clearly tell this, um, they're not for the people because, like I said before, that's clearly terrorism. What black people did, they just protested without being harmful to nobody. Like, that is come on, that's clearly terrorism. If you look at our rights, our rights are to peaceful protest, to protest the government. Mm -hmm but not to injure the government or to like harm anyone. Also our rights to own arms, our right to, to bear arms is directly in case the government tries to backfire or prevent us from having arms in case to fight back the government. It's not really a right to have at home. That's not what the purpose of the right of arms were. Also they have, I don't know, I think his name is Kyle Rittenhouse. I don't remember his name though. He walked around with a whole assault rifle for protection. He killed people. Come I think I'm pretty now. sure he killed people Come too. Come on, that that's clearly racism. Come on, with a rifle. If a black guy was out with a rifle like that, he would be dead. That doesn't make any sense. For like black guy matter is not hurting people. They're just walking, screaming. Nobody's trying to really kill you. So that's just crazy. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, if you really want to take it more recently you can look at the murder of the guy in Cleveland Ohio versus the um, arrest without any shots on the shooter at the July 4th parade if you really want to bring that up like just recently like that's two examples within a week of each other even more recently the protests of the pro like Roe versus Wade um, a lot of women are being threatened, have been gassed, threatened to be arrested, have been arrested, have been held at gunpoint by police officers. And the most violent I've seen women do is they put fake blood on their pants and sat there and showed the police the pants and said, <coughs> this is what's going to happen if you have someone who's harmful, which the baby's harmful to keep the baby. Or also the right to contraceptives and birth control. That's the most harmful I've seen. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, I think the issue too, especially especially with the with the uh, I'm gonna call it the act of terrorism uh, that happened on our capital, and it's like the privilege that the people had. Like I saw like old people, like pictures of people that, like you know what I'm saying, like old people, like uh, it's just they had they felt so comfortable doing what they did. Like they had strong convictions that they totally thought they were right. Like they thought that what they were doing was actually beneficial and that they had the right to storm the Capitol. Like, I think that's just mind boggling to me because it's like, I'm not going to excuse, like, I think something that should be taken to account was there was, I, there was videos and there was people that did destroy stores. And I'm not going to say stores over human. I'm just saying, 
in general, like that wasn't right. Like it should be peaceful protest. Like we said, we have the right to peaceful protest. So those things should have not happened, regardless if it was a multi-million dollar company, like nobody should be destroying property. But it's like, you do it out on the streets where that's, that's open and free. You know, majority of people did do it on the streets. And I think the thing is, is that when the few people at the riot, like uh, at the storming of the Capitol, the few people that did the worst things, like the guy that had like the big spear, like they targeted like, okay, one person, but that doesn't show the majority. But when it comes to like movements like Black Lives Matter, they paint everybody as bad if one group of people do something bad, like the radicals of it. Like, oh, everybody, the Black Lives Matter was bad because these certain people stormed the target. And I think like with like, especially like Black protests, like it's, and even like Black people in general, like they say because there's Black on Black crime, therefore there, there's a stigma about it. And I think like that's wrong in my, I mean, I think, yeah, that, that's wrong. And then like on top of all that, um, they have facial recognition scans going at the peaceful protest to find the people afterwards. There have been a marketed amount. I think there's been like five different uh, un- unsolvable deaths of leaders of different marches where they were found like burned in their car. It, it's It's actually insane. I mean, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it actually happened. Hmm. Okay, Alyssa. So we're, I guess you could figure out, we're talking about Black Lives Matter versus the January 6th insurrection. And also how the notion that it's legal to nonviolently protest. Obviously you can't have a democracy I mean, you know, oh, we have a democracy, but nobody can ever question the leaders. Like, <laughs> that's not a democracy, right? Mm-hmm. So, right. Um, so do you have a, a overall impression? Was there a double standard there? Do you think um, Black Lives Matter was um, portrayed as a lot more violent than it was and racism played a role in it? I think that's what people are talking about, right? Can you right. okay. Okay. Go ahead, Alyssa, because I know you've thought about this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think obviously there's a double standard, um, especially since the difference between the riots are so stark. Like there's it's one thing to storm a target and you know destroy property, but it's another to go into one of the most uh important buildings in the democratic world and try to disrupt an election. And they've been handled so differently by police officers that were at both. And then um like what Ryan said with like the stigma of like black on black crime and everything. Um, a lot of people like fail to look at that for most racial groups the most crime is committed by somebody in their same racial group just because they tend to live with each other Um, so like obviously in a black neighborhood most of the crime is going to be black on black and same in a white neighborhood and a hispanic neighborhood Um, but like just the difference between how the riots have been portrayed is just so stark Um, and I know like like my dad, he's a conservative, like my family's a conservative, uh, a conservative family. And like he, when he talks about the uh, riots, he says, oh, well, they were burning down the city. They weren't actually burning down the city. The cities are still, you know, up and running. Like everyone went to work the next day. Maybe not at that one target in Minnesota, but, <laughs> you know, the city's still standing versus trying to actually disrupt the democratic process. <laughs> I just and, go ahead. Um, um, it was just I know I wrote a paper for you, Dr. Beck, about um the Black Lives Matter movement mm-hmm. and how so many people portray it as like a black and um supremacy movement when it's really a equality movement. And that's just something I think was grossly uh mis uh portrayed in media. So, I mean, the lesson learned is please step back, right? Step back from the emotions. Um, Here's a problem is that I just, you know, I have my preferred news outlet and 
it just happened that some Princeton professor had done a was doing research what percentage of the Black Lives Matter was actually violent, what percent was peaceful. Um, and so if you can get a hold of that, right? Like you don't want to have an opinion or reaction unless you can find out what are the percentages, you know, not what's coming up on the news screen because the news is going to be sensationalist in order to get people to watch. So I would say be very careful about news that makes money off of sensationalizing stuff. Try to find a news outlet that doesn't profit from that. Um, and I mean, what would I recommend? I mean, national public radio, right? Public radio doesn't profit. It doesn't depend on how many people watch it. Um, okay, but well, I understand, Tim, that's right. But the thing is, how can you find something else? Where, where do you go to look for something that actually will give you some information? Um, so I hope it's okay for you. I mean, I, can, I was there at the civil rights movement, right? My dad marched in Selma when I was um, in fifth grade and I still remember that. So I, you know, I can see the analogies and the disanalogies a little bit better. Um, but one of the things that stands out is that all, we have all these video clips. Now, on the one hand, we can actually get information, but on the other hand, they're very isolated and very emotional, right? And so you really have to decide, you know, that I'm going to step back and try to find something, try to find the right way to think about this. Um, the outsider claim was funny because that's what they said about Martin Luther King. So right away in Black Lives Matter, that's the outsiders are coming in like, and I knew that, right? I knew that before anybody actually said that. But the other thing that happened during the Martin Luther King that also happened this time was that um, FBI and CIA agents under Martin Luther King were they went in, they were plain closed and they tried to incite people to become violent, right? Okay, because um, the head of the FBI despised Martin Luther King. He really, like he had a fixation about Martin Luther King, um, J. Edgar Hoover. But anyway, this time it was um, uh, plain closed police officers that wanted the movement to fail well, I mean, sure, you just go there, look like a normal person and you start becoming violent, but you do it kind of indirectly because you don't want the white people to be violent. <laughs> and so you kind of incite it. So you really have to be careful um, about how you think about it and try to find the data. Um, Martin Luther King also had, like a lot of my students, Alyssa, I think maybe this happened the, in the one class I had, they kept idealizing. Well, back in King's day, it wasn't like this. And it was, ah, it sure was. I mean, I would say it was worse um, because on the one hand, he had to deal with complacent people, people who had adjusted to the society and they didn't want to make waves because it was hard enough to make it into the middle class. They're not gonna take any risks. I mean, it's understandable, but it's still, you know, you gotta help other people. And then at the other extreme, there, were, I, there was a big black power movement that was coming in and they were, they were violent and they were advocating violence. And so Martin Luther King was considered, uh, what, an Oreo cookie. Like he, he was too, locked into the system for them, right? He was too willing to get arrested. Um, so he was getting a lot of criticism. As a matter of fact, if he hadn't been shot right then, he might have lost his moral um, you know, leadership powers. So I, I don't, you know, I'm not happy he got shot, 
but he still got shot before his own, there was a growing number of blacks that weren't going to go along with it. So um, anyway, and I think, so what I want to talk about is that in his mind, he's acting in a long, long standing tradition from the Old Testament on. And this is such an important tradition because if we don't preserve this tradition, we will devolve into authoritarianism. There's no question about it. Again, it's the same with Athens. None of them thought we'll never lose our democracy and they did, right? It can happen. So um, this is a place where the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Greco-Roman tradition can be synthesized. And I think that's the best reading of it. And if you remember, our founding fathers were extremely progressive. They questioned the status quo, right? They declared war on their country. So Martin Luther King was not declaring war on his country. Um, he's not that he's not nearly as radical as our founding fathers, incidentally. He also had a very traditional kind of religious point of view. It was social justice gospel. He was not, it was not a radical Christian point of view. It was a very traditional. So he was really actually a very conservative in terms of he's making America make good on its declaration that all people are equal. I mean, how could you be more conservative than that? is actually you're biting your, you know, you're based on principles. And then he's acting in this tradition of nonviolent civil disobedience, which is what Jesus did, incidentally, what Paul did, what the prophets did. So I really want to convey this to you that there is a tradition here that I, it's the liberal arts colleges are part of that tradition. So I am going to speak up to that tradition and I'm going to hand it to you and tell you, you know, I hope you take this torch and, you know, live your life by this light and then pass it to the next generation because I don't know how else we're going to preserve our democracy. So um, let me just go through the outline. Um, but does anybody have a question or a comment? I do. Um... I was just thinking about how lauded Martin Luther King is compared to Malcolm X when Malcolm X did a lot for the community, but he's not celebrated because he embraced violence. And I don't think that should necessarily be a negative. It's a defensive strategy. Uh, whenever people, and he said, he has this quote that talked about white liberals are the most dangerous simply because they will put property over human every time because they're like, no violence ever. No, there's, it's never necessary. Whenever it is necessary. So. I know, and Martin Luther King was really, really, the letter was mostly to these white moderates who claimed to be Christian and all this stuff, but they, they kept telling him you have to wait. He said, we've waited 340 years. Um, so, what did you start out saying, Jordan? I was gonna. Yeah. Um, how people love Martin Luther King. And oh, okay. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I read it when I was in high school and I will never forget it. Um, the thing about it is you look at the different, it, you know, it really matters if your relatives were house slaves or, uh, you know, the on the on the field, field slaves, because the ones experience a lot more violence than the other. And also, I mean, it depends. There's so many different circumstances that tend to get carried down. So um, my, um, Malcolm X grew up. Uh, it's an, an amazing story. Basically, his I think his father got killed and his mother went kind of bonkers, but he was poor. He went through a lot of phases, and this is where I grew to, res I respected him, but people didn't understand. He was a lot more than just these t-shirts by whatever means necessary, Malcolm X. It's so unfair to this guy.
because he lived through, he went through all this stuff. He was in prison. He educated himself in prison. He started reading the dictionary, stayed up all night reading. He really decided he was going to educate himself and come out there and be a leader afterwards. And then he got betrayed by the head of the Black Muslims. He had a confrontation with that guy because that guy, among other things, he was impregnating all these women. <laughs> and, you know, he was unfaithful and he was he was becoming a very authoritarian guy and he wasn't, you know, and so that was a problem. I mean, imagine this guy, Malcolm X, he's desperately trying to do the right thing after he's, you know, gotten himself in trouble. And then his, the people he worshiped, he worshiped this guy and that guy betrayed him. So that's how he got shot. He got shot by the other black Muslim group. Um, but what he did at the end is he went to Mecca and he changed and he really came back wanting toleration. So, I mean, really, the guy's very admirable. Nobody knows that story. But if you ever want to read the book, it's a great book. It's just that, of course, there's so many other books. African Americans since then, who now have written their books, and they have great books too. So the difference between then and now, that is that this time, there's so African American culture, the music, the literature, poetry, history, there's way more of it. And then there were interviews, again, I go on my news thing, and it has these interviews. There's all sorts of African Americans who are in US Congress, well, Obama, right? And then there's um, political leaders, governors, mayors of big cities, and they're men and women, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're, you know, it's, that's wonderful. So some of them, but still, you know, still we've got all sorts of systemic racism. And um, it's just a long haul. And people will remember, you know, for your generation and on, this is kind of the, the watershed moment. For me, it was, you know, years ago. But then you see, well, what has changed and what hasn't changed? And there has been a backlash. It's been very disappointing. There has been a serious backlash, which means we're going to have another Black Lives Matter movement. There's just inevitable. Um, but let me, um, I'm gonna go through the outline, but does anybody wanna make another comment before I, um, okay. All right, so um, let's go through, I mean, my dad was preaching this stuff at the time. So he was preaching, he was, he considered himself a prophetic minister because there are, there are two traditions. I mean, the Bible is so rich with all sorts of people having all sorts of opinions about God, all sorts of different historical experiences. It's really meant to be just this wonderful um, collection of the story between people and their idea of God or the Jews and their idea. I mean, it's supposed to be complicated and like life, actually. <laughs> but anyway, everybody knows the Bible was used to justify slavery, right? You can find a quote. And then the Old Testament also is prophets. The prophetic tradition is always speaking out against injustice. Uh, so, you know, unjust laws, this whole idea that there are natural just natural law, justice does not kowtow to any one particular ruler. And, and a person who really cares about God is going to always criticize or examine power in light of a higher truth. Now, you have to watch out. Some of those people are corrupt. Some of them claim to be that, and they're not. So that's complicated. But the tradition, you never accept. Might doesn't make right. 
nothing is ever true just because the leader said so. Um, Moses, remember, he, you know, was commanded to let my people go, right? And the Pharaoh fought and the Jews um, or the Hebrew people escaped. And this is continuing revelation, the idea that you have to keep adapting. This fits with the Aristotelian practical wisdom, if you remember. You're just constantly having to make just uh, judgments. You're judging, the situation changes. Our founders created a constitution and a system that would constantly adjust and change because they're educated in this tradition. Um, Jesus actually violated the Jewish, the religious laws. If you remember on the Sermon on the Mount, he's not a legalist. He doesn't tell you you're right or wrong based on either political laws or religious laws. Um, there's the spirit of the law. Okay, so segregationist laws went against both the civil rights, the federal law, and against God's law. Paul uh, risked being killed by political leaders, right? And he was crucified. Um, it is, yeah, there's another thing. Marcus Aurelius, when he was the emperor, didn't even think the Christians, why are we persecuting these people? They're really nice people. <laughs> But, you know, it was political. Um, okay, so this tradition of nonviolent resistance, Jesus, Paul, uh, the early Christians, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Socrates, um, and then Euthyphro went the other way, right? So sometimes people, people in the name of God will demonstrate for, uh, you know, criticize, in the name of a higher law, and they'll disagree. That's why we had God is not a Republican or a Democrat, right? It's not cut and dried. But Martin Luther King refers to St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and I think, you know, you can simplify it and say there's absolutely no biological genetic reason to, to justify unequal treatment. It's based on a lie. So now we have to structure our society in some way to get to lift up African Americans, just like with women. You know, there is absolutely no biological reason. It's all a big mistake. So even if there's all that social conditioning, like John Stuart Mill talked about, it's still wrong, and we still have to move forward. Um, Aristotle was also used to justify slavery. I don't think it was a good reference to Aristotle, but again, nothing's true just because Aristotle said it. Um, distribution of social goods. So if you remember the categories Aristotle had for practical wisdom. So yes, we disagree, we debate. How are we gonna provide education, healthcare, housing? How do we do this in a way that's not racist? And it's very complicated because for centuries, it has been racist. How do you stop the ball from rolling down that hill and you know move it? It's hard. How about the criminal justice system? How about applying the laws in a particular situation? All right, Seneca, the Romans also had an international law. Augustine had the notion of eternal law. St. Thomas had the notion. Martin Luther King had a PhD, you know, he studied all this stuff. Um, the divine law and the natural law, the old law, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And here's the letter from Birmingham jail. So why did he take direct action? He tried to negotiate. So that's rule number one. You have to try to, to negotiate. And then if the people refuse, you have to take direct action. You can't comply with might makes right. Why didn't I wait until the next election? He said it wasn't going to change anything. Why can't you wait? We've been waiting. All right. Um, we're demonstrating against unjust. Oh, this is a particular movement, right? They had all their evidence. It wasn't any just general thing. It was the way garbage collectors were treated. 
he wanted to, he applied for a permit to parade, right? People who are going to have parades, nonviolent uh, walking in the street should be able to get a permit. Of course, he wasn't given a permit, but he tried. He tried to go through the system and the system failed him. So um, your actions precipitate violence. No, they don't. There's nothing inherently. It's white people act violently in response to my actions. It's not my fault, <laughs> right? Okay, so the theory of the golden mean Nonviolent resistance is between two extremes, just allowing for racism, doing nothing, or violence, trying to overthrow the system. Um, okay, let's see. I'm especially disappointed in the church. And I agree with that because religious leaders really should be should criticize in the, in the name of a higher power. I, I think religious leaders should be critical of racism and they should be critical of sexism because they're wrong. <laughs> um, and a lot of them are not, you know? The church has also been used to support white supremacy and uh, sexism and slavery, you name it. So, so I understand why I was disappointed and why I was disappointed in the white moderates. Um, and, you know, that's, let's see. Um, this is a, this article is a short one about institutionalized racism. And it really talks about the housing situation, which housing, I mean, really, if you wanna start somewhere, like I said, I said this before, blacks have never gotten equal uh, houses that create value. And that, and then you have the taxes our local taxes based on the value of your house to pay for schools. So then you don't get good education for your kids. So you can't move forward in the next generation. So um, if anybody says, oh, anybody writes off institutional racism? No, no. I saw this person behave in this terrible way. It is, it is important to step back and look at the whole system, I think. Um, all right. And I wanted to point out one quote. Okay, he had trouble with organized religion. He was a radical conservative. Um, his The founding fathers were also radical progressives, religious heretics and political traitors. Even though he was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. Um, Remember, you know, Socrates says, I can't worry about what I'm getting labeled. Whatever I do, I'll get labeled. We have a natural capacity to recognize the truth. We should use our minds. Liberal arts at Lyon is designed to awaken this capacity for intellectual honesty and commitment to truth. And then he quotes Socrates, right? Just as Socrates felt it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myth. Remember he said, I'm like a gadfly. That just annoys you. Um, we must see the need for nonviolent gadflies. You see, he's read his Plato to create the kind of tension that will help people rise from the dark depths of prejudice. He united reason and faith. So that's my main point is that he's very much in the tradition. Um, and I, I like the tradition. I've worked at an institution that's based on it. And so I've spent my career defending it. And that, that's been good. I mean, I've been lucky. I hope all of you get jobs where you get paid to do something you really believe in, um, especially at this moment, because we're not gonna get over polarization and we're not gonna save our democracy unless we really learn to use our minds, I think. Um, so now I want you to talk about the branch of humanism. This particular, the tradition that I described is a humanist tradition. Christian humanism and any kind of humanism. Our founders were pretty open, but they the thing they came down on was the humanism because that's what enables you to act like a citizen. Okay, Colin, what version of humanism did you come up with? Okay, um, 
I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get my document. I did scientific humanism um, with, I found this article that really combined the idea of scientific and naturalism, which is pretty much the idea that anything that happens within the world can be explained with science and normal humanism and they kind of combined them together and it was something that really like affects me personally being stem and all those things is i personally i believe that there may be a divine power a divine deity whatever you'd like to say but I also believe that everything can be explained through science for the most part, except for miracles, which is why I would say the divine deity idea. But well, actually the founders thought of God as a clockmaker that wound up the system and let it go. So you could. Yeah. And both of like the scientific revolution happened in the 16th and 17th century when the alignment happened, like, 17th 18th century which is like around the time for america like really being founded and things yeah. of that nature so these ideas were i guess fresh is the way to put it it's kind of weird to say it like that during that time and uh ben franklin in my personal opinion i think was a lot bigger of a role within society and during that time, then people make it seem like I think he did a lot more behind the scenes than what is truly accepted. And I know he pushed a lot more towards science and finding answers that way. Would you embrace, did, this, did the scientific humans as a worldview look like something you might want to embrace? Um, I think it's something I kind of embraced without knowing, like, Okay. That was a thing because right. that's it, the purpose of my job. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really know like scientific humanism was like a real idea and thought. I just kind of had my idea. Then you sit, brought that up and I was like, huh, let me look at it. And I was like, well, yeah, I kind of agree with this a lot. Good. That's good. And you'll make it your own, you know, your own creative activity okay jordan what about you i did mine on humanism and abortion okay um i read a really good article talking about the only time humanists should be against abortion is if it's forcefully put upon the woman like in scientology they sometimes force the woman uh to have an abortion um like coerce them into it and the same was true in Ireland for these two sisters who would take an unwed woman uh and they found over 700 baby bones uh underneath the church and the and the children who survived past um infancy uh they were all malnourished and had not been held and were off and many babies were for forcibly taken from the mothers and put up to for adoption um and I think humanist stance is, from all that I've read uh, are all about the woman first because it's her autonomy and that's what they put emphasis on. Um, I think in the vice, I looked at the vices and virtues for, for this topic. And I, the only one I really could find, hold on, I'm pulling it up. The only one I could really find uh, that kind of went with this uh, narrative i guess uh or this topic was social conduct um and maybe shame and i i feel like the virtue <laughs> the vices of virtues aren't really in the favor of abortion from what i can read but if you interpret it differently like with uh his uh social conduct he said um that friendliness and cantankerousness <laughs> Friendliness was a virtue and cantankerousness was a vice. And I find, like, if you look at who stands outside abortion clinics trying to coerce women into having a baby that they don't want and who actually stands outside to protect the woman, I would say that one was more friendly than the other one. Um, 
And then human rights, uh, you United States actually kind of broke the Geneva Convention because uh, forcibly making a woman uh, go through with a pregnancy is uh, against human rights, according to uh, Geneva Convention. And I think with the human rights list, I could not find a co uh, like a comprehensive list, but um, it does go against uh, rights because it goes against the liberty of the insecurity of persons. So it goes against the liberty of the woman and the security of them as a person. Okay. Okay. Brian. Okay, let me pull up my paper. Or not my paper, but the... Okay, so the humanism I chose was Christian humanism. Okay. Um, and I was saying it's kind of funny because I actually don't label myself as a Christian, even though I agree with the kind of the idea behind Christian humanism. And I think it's a nice balance, but I'm personally somebody who doesn't like to categorize themselves. Like I don't want to be labeled as a certain group because, you know, I, I don't support all things. So therefore I'm just a spiritual person. Um, and I believe that all people have godly wisdom and consciousness that was given from God. And so that is what Christian humanism believes that like, we have consciousness, we have our own like ideas, but that was given to us by God. And I believe that. And, um, you know, and that brought me to have the question of, can you be a good person without religion? Like, yeah, I think you'd be a good person without religion. And, you know, um, you don't have to be a certain Christian. You don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to be anything to be a good person. But I think at the, at the end of the day, like God gave us that. And that's whether you accept it or not, whether you believe it or not. Like it, for me, I choose to believe that God gave everybody um, a soul and gave them their wisdom and consciousness. And, you know, whether you choose to believe it or not, that's what I, I deem as fact because we talk about facts and value, morals, but I deem that as fact. Um, and um, Christian humanism states that, yeah, consciousness and their our decisions were, or our minds was because of God. The movement was essential during the rise of democracy in Europe. Uh, Christians was at the forefront of like the human rights uh, movement and um, the beginning of modern democracy. And despite the few atheists who played, played a large role, like Hobbes and Voltaire, um, mostly it was Christians that led the political like reform and just everything. And Christian humanism actually um, questioned and challenged the Catholic Church and the Bible. Uh, so I think that was really interesting because I believe that you need to question what you believe to truly gain a deeper understanding so that's like another thing that i believe in that um correlates to what they believe in um they also wanted religion to be a part of the political discussion which sometimes i battle with because you know as a follower of christ i you know god wants us to spread the word of him and so of course there's one side of me that wants to spread the word but i do believe in freedom and that people have the right to choose stated in the bible should not be 100 percent or should not even be in politics let me just say that i don't think it should be in politics even though i believe it like i don't think that that should be enforced and that was one of the things i disagree with with the christian so that's why i went back to i'm not i can't identify myself as a christian more i don't want to you know, identify as a Christian humanism, even though I correlate with so many things, there's some things that I just don't agree with. And so that's why I just don't really put myself as a label. But that was something that I found like that I agree with a lot. But yeah, it was really interesting. Okay, Alyssa. Um, I also wrote about Christian humanism, because I mean, obviously, I identify as a Catholic, and I think that's just where I have the most similarities as far as humanism goes, is with Christian humanism. 
um especially because they stress um how like it took god coming down as a human through jesus to save humanity and the emphasis on individuality and freedom is just so strong within it and it encourages people to make mistakes um (laughs) It made me think of like silly sayings. Some people say how like, if you don't sin a little bit, then God died for nothing. Um, And I think that's um, (laughs) good for you to go and like, you know, test some boundaries, question the church, question, I mean, question your religion. And I think you, uh, through like Christian humanism, that's where I can find those parts of my spirituality. Um, That was kind of all I had to say though (laughs) okay that's like it's okay to be Socratic (laughs) right um Michael um okay so the type of humanism uh I chose to review was social humanism uh social humanism is seen on a much broader scale than some more specific types of humanism uh and mirrors many of the aspects that we've already like discussed um, previously in class, um, but uh, what I liked about social humanism is that it focuses on the collective and not the individual. Um, and then uh, I was going to say, well, while reviewing social humanism, I also came across liberal humanism, which focuses on the individual and their freedoms. Um, so not necessarily the opposite, but um, kind of di- differing. Um, but ultimately, I was more invested uh, in social humanism and some of the arguments it put forth. Um, so social humanism is rooted in the idea that the most important thing is to pre- protect the equality of individuals in the world uh, instead of individual freedoms. Um, and they discuss, uh, social humanists discuss inequality as uh, uh, denying our sanctity because it allows for unimportant qualities. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that. Hold on. Uh, I, I, I believe it's just about, so basically there was liberal, and so the two that they were discussing, Jordan, was like liberal and social, um, and like what liberal was getting across is that it focuses on the individual and their freedoms, uh, whereas um, social humanism focuses on the collective, um, if that, did that answer your question? Okay, okay, cool, sorry. Um, uh, but social humanists uh, discuss inequality as just denying our sanctity because it allows for unimportant qualities like wealth and skin color uh, to produce oppression and privilege. Um, and I think in a, in a broader sense, uh, social humanism wants to elicit that um, all humans should and have to be uh, treated equally, especially if we're to keep a democratic society. Um, and I also thought that uh, one of the other things I liked about it was that I think it kind of approaches uh, humanism in a more top-down approach, um, which I think if done correctly, um, can keep people on, a, on an equal footing so that then individuals can work from a bottom-up approach to make necessary change uh, in a manner that's consistent with like the democracy that we want to have. So like you have to go to school. Well, yes, an, an education of some sort, yeah. So there are mandates, right? Is that what you mean by top down? I mean, when I said like top down, um, like focusing on the collective, but how we've talked a lot about how sometimes it takes individual efforts um, before we can see like actual collective, uh, like actual change for everyone. Um, and so I was, I, it was more so that um, it brings... I feel like it brought issues. It brings things um, from the top down, so um, bigger to smaller, so that so that individuals can actually make change at an individual level. Right. Can you give an example? Um, like of something that's already occurred, or just something that I would. Or you think ought to happen? I mean, there would be public well, school, there would be um, environmental laws. 
because yeah, I think, yeah i think that you could talk about environmental laws about establishing um i think it's more so like about about the government establishing these laws um and then people being able to um uh adopt them if you will okay aaron I chose, I guess I did, um, not guess, but um, I did humanism and business. Okay. And um, like, I found this article that like had like six points and it was um, the points, it was like talking about the points in terms of like treating your employees better, blah, blah, blah. But like, in my opinion, that to me is kind of like basic in terms of like business. Cause like, in terms of like the humanism and business aspect of, I'm sorry, I'm really tired, but like, I mean, I'm just going to read what I wrote. Okay. I mean, so like, basically this is, this is what I had, this is my opinion on it. Like allow, like basically allow employees to like maintain like their personalities and whatever as individualism is what it is. One of the points it talks about in the article allows like a company to thrive because it helps you set out like set yourself apart and from like being different to others. And like, I also believe that like, I think we're seeing it now, especially with like record profits and people struggling to get to work that businesses have kind of gone away from the whole, like the employees are human beings and like they view employees as resources more, so to speak. So like, I think that's necessary. I think we're going to see it. I hope to see a big shift in that. And like, because my major is business. So like, that's what I hope to take into the business field is like a desire to like make the employees actually have an input into business. Because I mean, like as a worker, like it's really frustrating to like see what goes on and that nose needs to be fixed, but they just don't fix it. And so like, like that's like to me, like, probably really important, especially in the business field, because jobs and working are very valuable for people. Like it provides purpose in people's lives. So you kind of need to treat them with respect. Good, very good. There's a lot of stuff on business ethics. I used to teach that class, actually. I don't know if Mr. Buby does teach it, if you want to, but. Okay, Zane, are you available? Oh, yes, ma'am, I am. Um, I was also also going to point on uh, Christian humanism. Uh, just kind of what pointed out to me was first, like, uh, whenever Martin Luther King was like uh, defining just law, and it's like whenever the law agrees with moral law and also the law of God, I found that pretty cool. Well, I mean, not cool, but anyways, what I was trying to say is like he kind of used like I mean, I mean, I'm a Christian myself, but I mean, I also agree that church and state should be divided but whenever it came to that subject you know he what he was for the civil rights movement especially you know whenever he used the bible the correct way and i think martin luther king you know he used it the right way instead of manipulating it like a lot of other religious leaders do like especially whenever they're trying to you know justify uh racism sexism and all that but whenever you use it the bible the correct way like martin luther king did i believe it's a powerful thing and especially the way he used it and saying like whenever the laws agree with each other with the law of God and the, you know, moral law. Um, that's just all now. That's what uh pointed out to me. Very good. Okay, Alexis. So I chose, I don't know if I did this wrong, but I chose uh, humanism and feminism. Okay. Or like women's rights. I'm more focused on women's rights. So the, um, Sorry, I was... <laughs> excuse me. So I focused on the fact that I tagged it out right here. I focused on how the differences, but how they also coexist and how they help each other. How feminism focuses on the rights of the human of not humans of women and how they're lacking equality and what how men are being treated better. But then I looked at humanism and humanism focuses on how both are equal and both should be treated equal and how both ways are 
treating women, treating one or another indifferently and how, but being feminine, being a feminist does not take back from you being a humanist. Is that how you say it? Mm-hmm. Is that the correct terminology? And it could coexist. So when a person considers themselves a feminist and a humanist, they are saying uh, women should be treated equally because women are rack- lacking certain rights. But if you look at a humanist standpoint, we should make, we're still making both equal, ones being treated lesser. And it should be corrected where they're both on equal standpoints. And it's, it's basically on how the whole world was taught because even today, a lot of people are being, tr- are being taught how one is higher than the other. And religion and teachings and households, it's, it's not equal grounding. And I looked at a lot of different videos and websites and I just saw how a lot of people just want to be equal and be treated the same, but it works different for each person. And some households, the women's in charge of finances, keeping the house clean, and the man's job is solely to go to work and to support the woman. In other ways, it's the opposite way, where the man's in charge of finances and everything, and the job, the woman's job is just to support. And it works for some people, but I do believe that the world would be a better place if we all treated each other equally and didn't focus on who had higher standing or who had the higher pay. And I grew up hearing from my mom that you need to look out for yourself because not only are you black, but you are a black female and you were, and you were literally at the most in a disadvantage for that. And I shouldn't, and no, I shouldn't, and no woman or black person should have to go through that. Okay, Tim, what humanism did you find? Okay, so I had a hard time finding it, but I ended up looking up some and let's see. I ended up looking up some and I wrote something down about where's that? Um okay, I did. Uh, I end up, well, there was one I looked up, evolutionary humanism. I couldn't really find what y'all talked about, but I just looked it up. And basically, it's um just wanted to, like, focus on, like, evolving. So, I mean, that's kind of good, but then it kind of skewed off a little bit, talking about superhumans rather than subhumans. I don't understand that part, but. I understand the part where you want to keep evolving and like have people reproduce for a good cause, but I I just don't know about the superhuman part though. Okay. Okay. So, so I did want to point out, um, all right. I don't know how, how many of you think uh, money is a problem, like the class, the, the, there's a divider, you know, and class is a problem and the gap between the rich and the poor is a problem. Um, and greed is a problem. So I did want to point out to you, here's a, a wrench or something, you know, to have to think about is um, when, let's see, I can't remember which of these, I'll, I'll catch it. But when Mr. Huckabee has his values, yeah, okay. So traditional values, right? The sanctity of life, traditional marriage, because his daughter is going to be governor of Arkansas pretty soon. So she's going to come in with, you know, this understanding of what their values are. Um, But they're against government. The government healthcare has the empathy of the IRS and the efficiency of FEMA. So he's critical, right? And he's in favor of missile defense against propping up banks because that's socialism. It's never right to do wrong Um, and, and the abyss of socialism. So it really is a minimal government intervention in the market. So I do want to just alert you to that and and have you think about 
does that make it harder for us to um, try to solve some of these problems of racism, cl uh, classism, right? Uh, the middle class, pulling people from the underclass into a middle class. Do we need social programs or we do just let the, the market decide? because right now money is sticking to money and there's huge inequalities, but that is definitely the belief system. And um, the first, the state of Arkansas has a super majority that's Republican and it has Walmart and it has the Koch brothers have a plant and they really are obviously minimal government. And, um, so Walmart hires its people, it pays them low enough that people have to, they qualify for government funding. <laughs> so Walmart doesn't even pay for its own people and people fall back to all that socialism to try and get the, get the ends to meet. So um, I do want you to think a little bit about how these problems of equality and even equality for whites, obviously white people getting into the middle class, is capitalism bad or good or what sort of mix of promoting the individual or promoting the collective um, are you? I do think you should think about it. Does that make sense? Um, does anybody have a thought right off the top Humanism tends to be thinking we are social and political by nature. And so the political system has to provide services to lift people up because it won't happen on their own because money will stick to money. But that, you know, there's plenty of business owners and I remember teaching business ethics who really go out of their way to try and be very humanistic and to create a climate in their business and to help people uh, move forward in their careers and develop skills. I mean, there's, there's plenty of them that do that. So it's not anti-capitalism. It's just, um, I'll just ask you for your, your first thoughts about where you think we are at this point in time in terms of, do we need less government intervention? more government intervention or just tweaking what we have and making it a better quality, um, making all the programs accountable. Um, okay, so that's what I want you to think about. Do you think this affects our ability to actually lift people up and have a middle class? Because that was Aristotle's top priority, but it's common sense. You can't have a democracy unless you have a stable middle class. So Colin, what do you think? Um, my personal opinion is that it needs to be tweaked so that it's running. And once it runs, then we can make more adjustments to see if what needs to be changed truly. Uh, you can't really tell like a pool. You can guess where the hole's at in a pool but you won't really know until you fill it with water and have it leak out. And it's sort of people in the professions that know best, right? Yes. <laughs> so people need to be critical of their own professions, what they're insiders on, and just be honest. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Jordan? Um, I think capitalism is the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think that there's no issue with labor. Labor is something that sh should be celebrated. But when capitalism gets put in place, people are used like what Colin said, like tools. Uh, they're degraded. Before 1920s, children were expected to participate in labor, and it wasn't until labor laws were put in place that there was actually protections for people. And even then, um, I feel like workers are exploited. Not so, like there's uh, so many cases of uh, war of um, pay theft by companies uh, simply so they don't have to pay the dividends. 
and underpayment of employees. I think that to improve this, we have to put it back into workers' hands. Often the most well-made and well-run companies are like Ben and Jerry's, which is oft, uh, which they utilize their workers and what they want, and they get to put in policies in place that they want. But it's not really something that people are going to move towards because that's not where the money is. It's all about profit. I think that's where capitalism, you know, really fails. The Ben and Jerry went to the college. I went to college. I went, so I kind of know about them. Um, Ryan? I personally feel like the system needs to be fixed. There's obviously things that systemly will, that's wrong with the system. But then after it's fixed, I feel like it should be hands off, like as much as possible. Um, I think there shouldn't be too much government intervention in my opinion. Um, but yeah. Okay, it, but it, things will always change. So just constantly have to make choices, but. Um, yeah, I, I think this is, but that's the hard thing about the United States because it's like what like how if it comes down to like what people believe like for example gun laws like you either believe it or you don't you know what I'm saying and like you're not really going to change how people feel and there will always be like people who it'll always be polarized regardless but I just feel like the government shouldn't have that much intervention with our life because I just feel like we should have freedom in what we do and that includes eventually at one point, hopefully taxes. That's one of the things I believe and other things like that. Yeah, um, okay, um, Alyssa. Um, I think that we need more government involvement simply because right now with like the way we've seen the government be more hands-off, we've seen far more um, like exploitation of workers, even workers that may um a great amount of money they're greatly um exploited and like with walmart and how they barely pay anyone like they're expecting the government to subsidize their um employees living expenses basically for them so by us not in uh by the government not being involved the government's paying for these people to live and i mean if we were able to like raise the minimum wage and everything like that it would be back on the company to pay for these people, not the government, not taxpayers. Um, and so like, that's just, I think we need more government involvement. In regulating corporations, right? Minimum wage, that would be regulating corporations or forcing them, right? Right, because right now, I mean, they're expecting taxpayers basically to pay for their employees to live. <laughs> okay, so when you say we need more government, specifically to get corporations to, to make laws where corporations have to change their ways? Yes. Okay, Michael? Um, I don't have like a particular view necessarily for capitalism, um, but I do think that like, uh, I think that like uh, the there's a huge like age division between those that make laws and the rest of us. Okay. Um, did you have something to say? I'm sorry. Oh, that's great. Old old people make laws. Right, right. Um, and I think that uh, you know, it's. I don't know. I think it's crazy that somebody who was probably, um, you know, helping segregate others is now making my loss. I don't know. I think that's, uh, I know there are like minimums, but I don't think there, I, I don't, are there, is there an age with which that like, you can't get, you know, elected into a position? I know like uh, 21 and 25, I think are the two, the two like minimums for- It isn't just that, it's old people vote. And so they'll vote for somebody their age, right? Right. Yeah. And they haven't, they don't know about environmental problems, right? Those are going to be your problems. Um, they do know about health care, but then you end up paying for old people health care. I mean, there's good arguments for this, right? 
Right. And you definitely can't discount like the vote of every individual over the age of 50. Um, by no means would that be, you know, democratic. Um, but the world changes and sometimes the people do not change with it. Right. Okay. Well, 70, 80, I mean, people live a long time too. Um, Aaron, what about you? I think it should be tweaked. Like, I mean, I think there's like obvious, like glaring, like red flags at the start, off the start, like with money being in politics in terms of lobbying and stuff, like going off like kind of what Colin said about like filling it up to let it drain out. Like to me, we can slap a, slap a piece of duct tape on it just by removing the money or like setting term limits or something like that. Like that's an easy fix, but it would require the people benefiting off of that to enact that. And so it's going to be kind of hard for that to happen, I think. Okay, Alexis, go ahead. I have said this, I think I have in this class before, but the rate I should be paid is the rate I need to live in a certain area. Like it's different for each place because I don't need freaking thousands and billions of dollars like maybe someone who lives in california i live in a military town you can get a two bedroom two bathroom and a nice living room and a nice updated kitchen for 900 dollars a month that includes utilities I don't, I don't need i don't need a lot of money like someone in california but i should be getting paid enough to where I'm not getting paid enough just to make it to, to work again the next day. Okay, good. So the minimum wage could be different in a different state. Um, okay, Tim. Going from um, using people as like, um, like just workers that's so true because some people who are working like constantly still don't have the means to uh, sustain a house even though they're working a lot so like the money they're getting for certain jobs I think they should go up or either the housing should go down because there's, I just don't believe that people can work all day and and still struggle about getting a house like if you're working you should be able to at least find somewhere where it's not so much. That's what, like in Florida, where I'm at, a lot of nothing's really cheap. So it's like if there's two incomes, you have to have two incomes in one house. But if you don't, you're gonna like unfortunately lose it. Especially like if you don't work no big job, you're not you're not getting a house at no McDonald's, not even an apartment if you work at McDonald's. That's how bad it is right now. So I think just you got to lower the prices of houses or something because some people are working too hard to not to worry about all this um, financial stuff or houses and stuff. Yeah, they can't become engaged citizens. They can't, you know, engage in citizenship, right? Um, Zane. Oh, I kind of agree with the kind of regulating it and uh, just tweaking it, I believe. But also, I believe uh, what Ryan said earlier is like whenever they do tweak it, I know it continues to change. But like whenever we can get something fixed, I believe that the government. I mean, obviously they need to be you know intervening a little bit, but I think they should try to stay out of it as much as possible. But I mean, obviously everybody has a different opinion, but that's just kind of what I think. Of. Okay, so all right, the project is to try to have a middle class, and the middle class has shrunk since the 1980s, since 1980. Um, and that's, you know, that makes for instability and security. It's hard and the cost of education has gone up. And um, so I appreciate all your parents who've made sacrifices so you can come to Lyon. That's, uh, you know, you guys are unique in that sense. Um, probably the majority of students at small liberal arts college are 
better off than the majority of students at Lyon. So this is really the American dream, pulling yourself up. Um, and I appreciate it a lot, but it's, it's, a, it's hard to um, embrace humanism and to figure out, well, how do we do this? How do we try to help people flourish? Um, and I don't, I've read enough, I know it's complicated. I just think if each person would look at their own profession or their own, you know, wherever in society they actually see something going on that's either helping or hurting, that they can bring it to the table and we can start talking about it. Because otherwise it's so easy to like see it from the outside and have an opinion. So I don't, I do want you to say, well, I don't have an educated opinion on this. Here's what I think, but I know I got to do the research on it. Um, but I would worry about this or that. Um, all right, so we will see you tomorrow. We're going to read from Houston Smith, The World Full, World's Religions. I hope you've bought it by now. It really, um, if you haven't bought it, uh, how many of you haven't bought it? Anybody, you could punch the hand raise whatever emoji or whatever reaction. I haven't received it. My mail has been acting. I don't know if I'll have it by tomorrow. Anybody else not have it? That's, that's what I was going to say. I've ordered it. It's just not come in. What about you, I Ryan? Find it on have you ordered it? Yeah, same. It hasn't came, came in yet. Okay, well, I have uh, scanned copies, so I will attach them. Uh, but I don't want, I don't want you, to, I do want you to buy the book because it's really flagrantly violating <laughs> American laws. I have them scanned because I taught in Asia and those girls just don't have access to the books. So I can do that for you, but, but you have to promise me you'll buy the book. Um, it's not expensive. Um, and so I'll, I'll do that for you. So there's a, there's a reading on Confucianism and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you.